Hello, Dr. Shlaim. I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you for sitting with me today and speaking with me on the current state of affairs in Palestine, um, as well as some other things I'm hoping to speak with you about uh, history as a discipline and an endeavor, uh, moving yourself to Israel and your disenchantment with Zionism and the possibility of a just coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis. So perhaps we can start off with the new historian title that uh, you're often uh, ascribed with. Uh, could you tell us what it means to be a new historian? Yes, I can, uh, because I'm one of the three original new historians. Um, the other two are Benny Morris and Ilan Pape. Uh, and uh, in 19... 88, on the 40th anniversary of the birth of the State of Israel, uh, the three of us published books and dealing with 1948. Um, and there is a traditional Zionist account of what happened in that year. Uh, and Israel is featured as the victim uh, and it is claimed that there was a unified Arab uh, coalition which attacked Israel, the newly born state of Israel, um, with one war aim, which was genocide, to throw the Jews into the sea and to frustrate the birth of the, st of the Jewish state. And my colleagues and I challenge uh, this traditional Zionist version of events. And what was important in our work is that it was based on archival research. Mm -hmm. um, Israel, to its credit, has a 30-year rule which governs the review and declassification of official documents. So we had access to all the Israeli uh, archives for that period, as well as British, American, and UN archives and primary Arabic sources. So this was proper history um, uh, as opposed to um, the Zionist historiography that preceded us. Um, my book is called Collusion Across the Jordan, King Abdallah, the Zionist Movement and the Partition of Palestine. And I argue that by 1947, King Abdallah and the Jewish agency had reached a tacit agreement to divide uh, Palestine between themselves and at the expense of the Palestinians. And this is what happened indeed. So the winners in the 1948 war were Israel, which extended its borders way beyond what the UN had decreed to 78% of historic Palestine. Uh, and the other winner was King Abdallah of Jordan, who captured the West Bank and that later annexed it to his kingdom. The losers were the Palestinians. And uh, if I may add, um, my book completely upended Zionist historiography because until because there, it's a, uh, the conflict is described as a straightforward bipolar affair with Israel on one side and the Palestinians and all the Arabs on the other side. And I argue that below, the, this is what it things looked like on the surface, but below the surface, the real lineup was Hashemites, King Abdallah was a Hashemite ruler, Hashemites and Zionists on one side and Palestinians and Arab nationalists on the other side. So that in a nutshell is the new history. And I know that you've also done history, written about uh, history uh, or specifically your own history uh, in doing your recent memoir. And you talk about um, coming from Iraq and um, moving to Israel and I'm wondering what uh, eventually prompted that and what the relations at the time between Palestinians and Israelis were like. Writing about myself 
was very, very difficult. Uh, I had written several history books and I had written a biography of King Hussein of Jordan that was straightforward. I was writing about one man and everything revolved around uh, the central figure. But I'd never written about myself, let alone about myself up to the age of 18. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, what persuaded me to embark on this exercise uh, is to write not a, pers not an auto straightforward autobiography, mm -hmm. but a family history. Mm -hmm. Because although I'm not important, I lived in, in really revolutionary times, uh, eventful, uh, an eventful period in the history of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And my family and I, we were Iraqi Jews. Uh, we were Arab Jews. We were Iraqis with very deep roots in Iraq, going back to the Babylonian exile two and a half millennia ago. Uh, we spoke Arabic at home, only Arabic, um, and we were Iraqis whose religion happened to be Judaism. And there were many um, minorities in Iraq, many minorities, and the Jews didn't stand out. The Jews were one minority among others, and there was a long tradition of religious tolerance and coexistence between the different minorities. So we, for us, Muslim-Jewish uh, coexistence was not an abstract idea. Um, it was the everyday reality. Um, and um, then, against our will, um, for reasons that we didn't, we, we couldn't control and we couldn't even understand, we were catapulted into Israel, to Israel in 1950. Um, and this was quite traumatic, not just for us, but for the 125,000 Iraqi Jews who ended up in Israel. For the community as a whole, the experience was like a tree being pulled up by the roots. Um, and in Israel, we didn't have a very welcome reception. Um, uh, my family and I were spared going into transit camps, uh, Ma'abarot, with all the hardships that that involved. Uh, but for the great majority of Iraqi Jews who arrived in Israel, this was quite traumatic. They were sprayed with DDT. Um, with pesticide on arrival. Uh, so that's the first impression of the um, promised land. Uh, and for me, as a boy of five, um, it was a huge upheaval, a completely new society. I had to learn a new language. But above all, I was conscious of being an Iraqi boy. And Israel was, uh, do, uh, the dominant ethos was Ashkenazi European ethos. This is what the new state was about, and therefore I could never feel, I could never feel that I belonged there. I felt an outsider, I felt out of place, and also I had a sense of in, inferiority inculcated in me because I looked around me and I saw that people looked down on Oriental Jews people looked down on Arabic, so I was embarrassed to, when my father spoke to me in Arabic in front of my friends in the street. So in Israel, I had a sense of inferiority um, on account of being from an Arab country, which stayed with me until I left the country much later on. Wow. And at a certain point, did you adopt Zionism as a worldview, despite these contradictions you were seeing. Um, and also, whether you can comment on how Zionism was perceived in Iraq before you left. The Jewish community in Iraq had very little to do with Zionism. Uh, Zionism was a movement by European Jews for European Jews. Um, 
and my mother used to um, talk a great deal about the wonderful Muslim friends that we had in Baghdad. And one day I asked her, did we have any Zionist friends? And she said, uh, no, um, Zionism is an Ashkenazi thing. It's nothing to do with us. And I think that reflected the predominant view of Iraqi uh, Jews. And look at it, looking at it from the other end, from the end of the Zionist movement, the Zionist movement never had any real interest in the Jews of the East. It um, revolved around the Jews of Europe and establishing a Jewish state in Palestine for European Jews. The change happened only after the Holocaust, which removed the main reservoir of Jews for the Jewish state to be. And it's only then that the Zionist leaders began to look at Jews wherever they could find them, from the four corners of the earth, including um, the uh, Jews of the Arab countries uh, on whom they tended to, to, to look down. So uh, in Iraq, Iraq didn't have a Jewish problem. Europe had a Jewish problem. Uh, in Europe, the Jews were the other. They stood out. And, and anti-Semitism is a European malady. It was born in Europe in the Middle Ages. The church had a lot to do with it. There was no tradition of anti-Semitism in the Arab world. Uh, it was exported from Europe to the Middle East. And um, it's interesting to note that um, this is in the interwar period, um, after the First World War, when there was a growth of anti-Semitism in Iraq and other Arab countries. There was no Arabic literature, anti-Semitic literature. So anti-Semitic literature had to be translated from European languages to, um, uh, to uh, Arabic. So the Zionist movement became uh, a divisive force. It drove a wedge between the Jewish communities in Arab countries uh, and the rest of the societies. So um, I know that 1967 was a pivotal year for you, or a turning point. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that and what happened at that time. I had a traditional education in Israel. <clears throat> and I was a Zionist, and at school I was taught the standard, the traditional Zionist version of the conflict, um, uh, and then I, in the mid-1960s, I served in the IDF, in the Israel Defense Forces, uh, and I was a very patriotic, and I served my country proudly and loyally because I believed in the justice of our cause. I believed that Israel was a small, liberal, uh, democratic, peace-loving country surrounded by Arab predators, and we had no choice but to stand up and fight. Um, uh, and in June 1967, everything changed and Israel trebled its territory, and Israel became a colonial power, lording it over millions of Arabs in the occupied territories. And for me, this was also a turning point, because my army, the army in which I had served loyally, became, and it was an army which was geared to protecting the country, defending the country against attack by regular uh, armies of the Arab states. But all this changed in the aftermath of the Israeli victory in the war. And the IDF became not the Israel Defense Force, it became the brutal police force of a brutal colonial power. Uh, and 
from then on, the main focus of the army was to police the occupation. We never saw any Arab civilians. We never dealt with Arab civilians. But after 1967, the main function of the Israeli army is to police the occupation. Um, so it was a turning point for me, and my disenchantment with Zionism and Israel uh, goes back to June 1967. Before we wrap up, if there's any final thoughts or observations you'd like to share. I'd like to uh, make three observations. Uh, and that is that uh, Israel uh, has obstructed every international effort at peace uh, since 1967. Israel is, has been diplomatically intransigent, and the Israeli occupation is the most prolonged and brutal occupation of modern times. The second observation is about the Palestinians. They have been demonized, but when you look at the reality, Palestinian intransigence is a myth. First, the PLO moderated its program and signed, a peace, uh, signed the Oslo Accord with Israel. Hamas was also an extremist movement with an extremist charter but it won a fair and free election in June 19, uh, 2006, and it was not allowed to govern by Israel and by Israel's Western allies. So Hamas moderated its program. Hamas offered Israel uh, negotiations on a long-term truce, uh, and Hamas also re um, uh, accepted a Palestinian state along the pre-1967 borders. All these gestures were uh, completely ignored by Israel, and Israel continued to use brute force to solve um, what is essentially a political problem. So um, there is no military solution to this conflict. Uh, there can only be a political solution, but Israel frustrates it. And my third observation is that the international community has singularly failed the Palestinian people. Um, and the international, uh, this is one of the most crying cases of injustice in modern history. And the international community has been unable to do anything for the Palestinians. And uh, more specifically, I blame America for the use of the veto to incapacitate and uh, not enable the Palestinian, um, the, 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 uh, the international community to protect the Palestinian people. But now I take some hope from the fact the, both the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice are looking at what Israel is doing, and in um, due course they'll come up with their conclusions. Uh, I'm sure they'll uphold the charges that Israel is committing genocide, and then uh, this would go to the Security Council, and one can only hope that America wouldn't use the veto again to defeat the, um, to um, prevent once again the international community from doing its duty to uh, the Palestinians. And if I may, I would offer one last reflection. Zionism, the establishment of the State of Israel involved a monumental injustice to the Palestinians, an injustice that is only exacerbated uh, over time and reach its climax, its most cruel climax in Gaza today. And I, as a Jew, feel a moral duty to support, to speak up for the Palestinian cause. And I think that all Jews uh, also have a moral duty to stand up by the Palestinians in the hour of need. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Schlamm, for this wonderful discussion, of course, for your time with TRT World today. Thank you.